This conference will now be recorded. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, the Squash Canada officiating webinar this evening. Tonight's topic is Referee Basics, Playing Without a Referee, and it is presented by Squash Canada, and our presenter is the one and only Dave Howard. Dave is a uh, Squash Canada national referee and examiner. He's a uh, FPS Pan Am regional referee. Uh, he is widely connected with the World Squash Officiating Group, and he is going to talk to you about the the simple stuff with respect to refereeing and how to do it as a player if you don't necessarily have a referee to do your match. So we're looking forward to today's presentation by Dave. If you do have any questions, just from a housekeeping standpoint, uh, I do encourage you as we go on throughout the presentation to type them into the chat box and we will, uh, Dave will either answer them throughout the presentation or I'll interrupt Dave and have him answer as we go along. Uh, we have set aside time at the end of the presentation to ensure all questions are answered. So if you are content, please just type them into the chat and we'll address them all at the end uh, just to make sure we get through the presentation portion and then uh, have time for full explanations of questions. Other than that, uh, just a reminder, please mute your microphones, turn off your webcams and uh, we will get started. Take it away, Dave. Okay. Uh Thanks very much, Jeff. I, uh, th this, uh, this presentation is, is very basic. We're not going to be talking about any of the complexities of calling lets and calling strokes. It's, uh, it's designed to, to basically fill you in on the, the basic rules of the game. If, um, if you want something a little more in depth, then we we definitely give uh, refereeing um, seminars and webinars, and uh, keep an eye on the web for those. There'll be a uh, uh, really exciting one coming up where we where we uh, actually go through a match with uh, with with a group and and uh, try and come up with the best calls. We'll do some, uh, you know, some polling on who thinks it's lets and strokes and it, it we're going to make it lots of fun. So um, stay tuned for that. But but the uh, the focus of this one is you're just starting the game and uh, you want to know the, the basic rules. So uh, you have no referee and um, and and you just want to you just want to know uh, whether the whether if it hits the line it's in or out and how you're supposed to serve and stuff like that. So so this uh, this is this is a basic outline on the screen of what we're going to be covering. We're going to be looking at the court itself, some of the basic rules, the uh, warm up, how to serve, how to score how to play and we're going to get into a little bit about uh uh let's and interference type stuff let's and strokes but not a great deal so we we won't be covering all of the rules if you want to if you want to know all of the rules see this um uh, this link down here world squash org rules of squash that will tell you all of the rules in detail and you can find whatever you want there. We have a Squash Canada has a course on the rules. We teach you all the rules. We ask you some questions at the end. And uh, if you pass, everybody passes eventually. You can take the take the exam number of times and the course a number of times, um, all for one good rate. So uh, if you if you actually want to go through our, our training and uh, take the exam. This is where you do it at this coursepark.com slash Squash Canada. We have a uh, an officiating group. And um, if you go to this website here, squashcanadaofficial.com, you'll find all kinds of uh, good resources, training modules, um, news. So we have a a probably every 
two or three months, we have a, a newsletter that goes out, has a little bit of humor in it, uh, compliments of our uh, local very faggy. And uh, it's a it's a very exciting website. And this is one that you want to sign up to if you're at all interested in in the rules and how to apply them. So um, again, what we're going to be talking about today is the basics, and um, it's going to be you and your you and your partner are going out to have a, a friendly game. Sometimes it turns a little a little more than totally friendly. A little bit of competitive edge there, and uh, but um, we all love a little bit of that. And uh, what 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 are you going to do if uh, if the ball hits the line, what are you going to do if a serve is out? We, uh, we just need to know some of the some of the basics. So let's get on to some of the basics. Hopefully, there we go. So the um, the aims of the rules is to ensure that the uh, the players play safely and uh, so nobody wants to uh, come off the court missing a couple of teeth or uh, or having a ball in the eye or uh, or or limping and and tearing a muscle you you, you want to make sure that things are safe on the court and you want to ensure that every time you have a rally there's a fair outcome uh, I would actually add a third there third bullet to that we all want to go out and have some fun so that's kind of the basics of uh, basic aims of of what we what we want to do um, I'd encourage everyone that uh, is just is really just starting the game get your get yourself either a, a, a really good player that knows what they're doing or preferably a go see a, a coach and um, start out with some good habits. So uh, learn, it may only take you a couple of lessons, but at least if you know how you're supposed to hit the ball, then um, then you won't have to break bad habits later. I know um, personally, I, I came to squash from, from badminton and I played for, all kinds of years uh, before I took a I actually took a court coaching course. I, I never had a lesson, but uh, I was I was playing badminton. I was always facing the front wall and making my all my shots facing the front wall because that's the way we do it in badminton. But in squash, you want to you want to be turning to the side and actually facing the side wall when you're hitting your shots. A lot of them anyway. So. Um, it's a it's a it's a good idea to to take a lesson or two and um, and at least start with with a couple of uh, good habits. <clears throat> now there's two types of courts. This is a picture of the uh, North American court and the big tilt. Uh, telltale uh, sign of what kind of court you're playing on is this little dip in the in the top line here. The so the the outline comes along, drops down, and goes across. So that's the North American courts. They were um, old, we call them old school for for higher ball, and um, around about the mid 70s. They didn't build any of these courts anymore. They're, they were all gone to what we're going to see now is the international court. So the international court, remember, you remember the the line that uh, on the north North American went across and down and and, and finished there. And this one actually goes from the top of the front wall straight to the middle of the back wall. So that's the uh, the basic 
the basic difference in the look of the court. Um, the length of the length of the the length of the North American court and the international court they're the same. They're 32 feet. The width of the North American court is uh, 18 and a half feet, and the width of the international court is 21 feet. So you've got an extra foot and a half on your width on on this style of court. Um, gives you if you're if you're a big guy like me, it gives you a little more room to to get to get your motor going to to get to the get to the uh, balls on the sidewall. The um, so the international courts far more common now, and um, they're uh, so so we're gonna we're gonna focus on international court, but. Basically, the rules don't change whether you're playing on this court or the North American. Unlike um, unlike pretty much all all other uh, uh, racket sports, the lines on uh, squash court are out. So most most racket sports, if not all the others, if it touches the line, it's still in. If the ball touches any part of the line in um, any any part of the line, then the ball is out. The um, so we'll talk about. Uh, I saw a a, uh, a little pop up message there. The there are two different tin heights. Um, the Tin height for the pros is uh, is slightly different, and um, but but for what all us regular players on the tin height is the same for all of us. So some some of the uh, specialized courts actually have uh, adjustable tins on them, and all the all the pro courts have uh, have a different different height of tin. Now. Um, so I'm just going to go over the uh, the lines on the wall and the walls themselves. So this uh, this is the front wall here, the front wall uh, outline goes across the top. This is the service line here in the middle, and then we've got a line on the top of the tin. The tin goes along the bottom of the front wall, and then we've got the side wall here and another side wall over here and there's an outline on this side and another outline on that side and um, then across the back there's also an outline and sometimes there it sometimes there's um, actually a different material above the back wall so you can you can hear if it goes out but um, but if it touches the the outline on the back wall, it's also out. So any of any of these lines here, the ball is out. This line here is the half court line, and then there's the short line here. And um, we, we don't use these lines during the rallies. In fact, we don't use any of the lines. In this area during the rally itself, these are only these are only there for serving. So this uh, this quarter of the court is one of the service box or one of the service sides. Good serving here. The other is this side. And of course, we gotta we gotta get into the court somehow. There's a door in, on the back wall. Okay. So now we know about uh, the two different kinds of courts, and we're going to go into how we're going to score. Now the um, the way that you score the standard standard scoring system these days is uh, uh, point a rally, which means that anytime you win a rally, you get uh, you get a point and Point a rally to 11, so we call it par 11, and that's the standard scoring system. 
Uh, we have some optional scoring systems used in provinces, clubs, leagues, uh, tournaments. So, uh, like quite often in a in a younger age junior tournament, because point of rally to 11 finishes pretty quick, you might play point of rally to 15. Um, and our club uses point of rally to 15. So um, with the with the point of rally systems, whichever you use, 11 or 15, the um, you have to win win by two points. So if if the score is 10 all, the first person to get to 11 doesn't necessarily win because they've only got 11 10. They they're only one point ahead. So you actually need to win by two points. So it could be you could win 12 10, you could win 13 11, you could win 26 to 24. So, so you can see that uh, uh, a game can go on can go on for quite a while. But uh, anyway, point of rally system, you need to win by two points. There's also a hand in hand out system that um, we used to play that was the before we came up with the point of rally to 11 we could um, uh, you could only win a point when you're serving so if uh if i'm serving and i and i win a point i get a point if i'm receiving and i win the point all that happens is that we go uh, we go hand out, and the other person is now serving with the um, with the same score. So if it's if I'm leading one love, I lose the point. Now the other person is serving, and they're serving love one. So you always say the person that's serving score first. So if I'm winning two one and serving, the score is two one. If I'm winning 2-1 and receiving then the score is 1-2 so you're always saying the server score first normally so so this is one game to either 11 15 or 9 uh, one other point about uh, about the hand in hand out system you at at 9 uh, sorry at 8 all the receiver calls one point or two so you don't win by you don't have to win by two points. You can win nine eight. So if I if if uh, if we're at eight all, the receiver can call one point. And if I if I win the point, I'm serving right. Uh, if I win the point, I win the game. If I lose the point, it becomes eight nine because it, remember in in hand in hand out. We don't actually get a point every every rally, and uh, if he calls, if my opponent calls two points, then it could go to nine all. But the first person to ten wins wins the game. You'd normally play um, best three out of five games, which means the first the first uh, person to get three games wins the match. Sometimes you play best two out of three games. And um, so the first person to get to two games wins the match. And if you're having a friendly game, you might play best of 15. So the, the first person to get eight games wins the match. It's uh, it's whatever whatever you whatever you want to do. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the uh, the warm up. The uh, oh. Here's a mistake on this slide. Have to fix that in the future. So um, the purpose is to allow the players the opportunity to warm up the ball and also warm themselves up. And um, basically, you're going to be hitting the ball back and forth to yourself and the and your opponent just to keep, get the ball warm and um, and give yourself a chance to stretch your arms and legs and back and while you're while there's no pressure of a game going on the uh the proper etiquette 
is to hit the ball back to your opponent fairly quickly. So either you hit it to your opponent, they hit it back, you hit it to them, they hit it back. Um, it's it's okay to hit a couple down the wall and then hit it back. So two or three times back to yourself is, is fine. Um, but the idea is that, that uh, and I've seen this a number of times where one player will just bang, bang, bang down the wall and the other the other players sitting there looking at the ceiling and kind of waiting to play. And that's, uh, uh, it's, it's poor squash etiquette. So, um, we, we want to make sure that both players are involved in the warm up and, uh, that they get equal, equal time to hit the ball. Now the official time for a warm up is actually four minutes. It was, uh, changed in the last rule change. Uh, two minutes on each side, but but if you're playing a friendly game, um, you can you can warm up for as long as you want. And if you don't want to play a game, you don't have to play a game. You can just keep hitting the ball back and forth yourselves and and have fun. But uh, uh, personally, I like a little bit of uh, I like to have a little bit of a uh, competition. So you um, you probably want to play a game but maybe not your choice okay so um now we're gonna we're gonna we've we've warmed the ball up and it's it's time to start a game we uh we need to know how to serve uh and who's serving so first thing we do after the warm-up we spin the racket uh and that determines which player serves first. So usually on the, uh, on the butt end of the racket, there's a, uh, the butt end of the racket, maybe there's an M or a W. My racket has a, has a mark here. So that mark would be up or down when I spin the racket. And some, some, um, some rackets actually have, you know, your serve and my serve on it. Um, they get a choice of, uh, the person that's not spinning chooses what they want. It's like choosing heads or tails. Um, whoever wins the spin um, is the is the is the first person to serve. Um, now the uh, server retains the serve. They keep serving until they lose a rally, at which point the other um, the other player becomes the server. Um, while retaining the serve, the server must serve from alternate service boxes. So if I start serving in the right box, it's your, actually your choice which box you want to start serving from. Um, if I serve and I win the point from the right, then I have to now go over and serve from the left box. And if I win my serve, if I win the rally, from the left box, now I go to the right box. If once I lose the rally, the other, my opponent becomes the server and they can start serving from whichever box they like. Um, but as they continue to win points, they have to alternate boxes. So at the beginning of uh, each game and each time there's a change of server, they can serve from whichever side they want to serve from. Okay, now these, um, this is the correct way to serve. And um, I'm going to tell you the correct way to serve, an incorrect way to serve. But um, you're not going to, as in a friendly game, you're not going to um, say that, tell your, tell your uh, opponent or your friend that uh, they, uh, they made a foot fault and they lose the point, uh, which is what happens in a real match. Um, but on the other hand, it's smart if you're ever going to play in a tournament or any kind of a uh, uh, a match, you need to practice serving properly because it's. I've uh, personally called uh, uh, a loss of point 
to a fairly young junior um, and uh, to, for that junior to try and change the way that they serve in the middle of a match is very difficult. They need to know up front that they need to serve properly um, and, and you need to practice serving properly or you're going to or you're going to have get yourself in a real pickle if you ever come to a match. So here's some pictures of correct uh, correct service. So if we look at uh, if we look at the foot here, it's totally within the service box. This is the service box here, and we'll show it a little bigger in a minute. And so this right foot is totally in the service box. It isn't touching the line, and um, it doesn't matter what the other foot's doing. There just needs to be one foot totally in the box. This, uh, on the other, on the, the second example, you see the person's toe touching the floor, still totally within the box and not touching a line. So this is, a, this is a, an example of a good serve also. Now, here's some examples of bad serves. And, and it all depends on when you actually hit the ball, by the way. So this, um, in this example, the uh, server is dragging their foot up. And when they hit the ball, their toe is touching the line. So there is no, there, there is no foot totally within the box when they make the serve, when they hit the ball serving. The second example, obviously touching the line, and that is a fault also, which means you lose the point. And third example here, uh, we've got one foot, which is totally outside the box. And this, when, when the server hits the ball, the uh, right foot here is totally in the air, not touching inside the box at all. So this is not a good serve either. Okay, so now where do we serve? This is the right service box here. Right service box is here. The left service box is here. And when you serve, you need to serve from whichever box you're serving from. So say you're serving from the right. So you serve from the right box. It has to go up. Ball has to go up. It has to touch somewhere between the service line and the and the front line on the front wall. So it has to hit the front wall in this area here. It can't touch the line, can't touch any of these lines. And then it has to go across here and land in the opposite quarter, back quarter of the court. So somewhere in this area here, without touching any of the lines. Now it's okay if the it's okay if the serve comes here. It's the front wall above the service line and below the front wall line, goes over here, hits the side wall below the outline on the side wall and into the other side of the box, into the other quarter. So somewhere in here, and that is a good serve also, as long as it doesn't touch any of the lines. So it can't touch it can't touch this line. It can't touch this line. 
it can't touch that line. And that's all before one bounce. So um, that's the that's how that's how you serve. Now, yeah, if you're serving from the um, from the lap box, same thing applies. You serve here. Has to hit the front wall above the service line, and then it has to end up back in the right box. Okay, so that's that's how you serve, and um, and I guess the you know the key is that you need to um, you need to serve from one side and get it into the quarter court on the other side, and um, the way that you I hope I I. I don't know if I have a slide for this, but I hope so. Let's just see. Okay. So um, the the a proper serve, you either throw the ball in the air and hit it, or um, you can actually if you want, throw the ball in the air and hit it from your racket. So throw it up in the air. The key is it has to go in the air somehow, either from the racket or your hand. Uh, the reason you do it from your racket is if, you, if you're a, a one-armed uh, a one-armed squash player, there's there are a number of those around. Then obviously you've got no left hand or right hand if you're right-handed to throw the ball up and then you hit it with your other hand. Um, if you t if you toss the ball, make no attempt to strike it, allowing it to fall to the floor or catching it. There is no penalty, and you may serve again. Same as same as with tennis, you see them throwing the ball up, and they don't like their throw. They just catch it, and they can do it again. Normally, they apologize when they do that, but uh, um, it's it's allowable. If you throw the ball up and then take a swing at it and miss it. Um, not the same thing. You do actually lose the point. Now the um, receiver, they don't have the right to return a serve that wasn't good. Uh, why would anyone want to? In a friendly, if uh, um, if you choose not to see that it touched the line and you want to play the ball, um, sure, you can go ahead and do that. Um, but Technically, if a serve touches the line, it's out. Or if it goes out of the court, it's out. Or if it bounces twice, it's not up. It's not a good shot. Um, so a handout occurs if the serve is not good, even if the receiver is not ready to receive the serve. Um, but if you, if I serve and you're not ready and you don't, take a swing at the ball, you just catch it uh, or let it bounce, then um, if I'm not ready, you serve again. So we play that, we play that again if you serve and I'm not ready. In a, uh, in a match situation um, with, a, with a real referee, if you're fiddling, fiddling around too much and delaying the game by not being ready for serve i deal with that as a conduct issue but you still um they still would get to would get to serving serve it again but i could be giving warnings or or even points away if uh if i find that you're delaying the game because you're uh, probably because you're too tired or you're trying to get in the head of the other person but uh um, it's if you're not ready, you're not ready, and you uh, you can't you can't get a point unless conduct is used. Um, if the serve strikes the front wall and side wall simultaneously, it's a fault. You lose the point. If it touches the side wall before the front wall, 
same thing, you lose the point. So it has to strike the front ball first. Now, a serve that is volleyed, which means that you haven't let it bounce um, before it might have been a fault, it becomes a good ball. As soon as you volley it, you've accepted that it was it was going to land in the opposite court. Okay. So, um, following the serve, the, the players hit alternate shots. We call it a rally until um, the ball isn't returned properly. And by not being returned properly, I'd say the ball is bounced twice or uh, you've carried it on your racket. So it's, it's actually possible when you're hitting the ball for the ball to, to stay on your racket. And um, and you know when you've done it, and your opponent usually knows when you've done it. So the ball should actually just pop off your racket. You can't carry it, uh, or uh, double hit. You can't you can't have it hit twice on your racket. Uh, if if uh, if that happens, then um, then you haven't hit the ball properly and it's not up, it's not a good shot, you lose the rally. Um, so we we hit alternate shots until you don't return it properly. The ball is out or down. So out means that uh, it uh, it's, either, it's touched one of the lines or it's actually gone, it's actually gone above one of the lines these lines here, um, or it's hit the ceiling. So any of those things are out, um, or it uh, it's down, which means that it hits the floor before it hits the front wall. And quite often, if you if you miss it or you're or you're out for a ball and you hit it off the uh, off the frame, it'll go down to the floor and then up. And uh, it can't do that. It has to, after one, after one bounce, I have to hit the ball and it has to eventually end up to the front wall without going out or down. And um, another way that you can end a rally is for one of the players to stop play by asking for a let. And we'll, uh, we'll deal a little bit with uh, some of the basics of, some of the basics of a let in a, in a minute. Just uh, have a question here, Dave, from uh, sure. Leslie. If yep. you weren't ready and your opponent serves, what do you call? Um, in a real match, you don't call anything. You just call the score again. Um, the um, so so you don't even have to ask for a let. You just say I was I was I wasn't ready, and you give them the ball. They serve it again. So. You don't need to. You don't need to call anything. Is that good? Any any other questions we can answer while we're while we're here? Nope. Okay. Let's continue. So now we're now we're into the uh, realm of. Uh, of interference, which means that uh, I'm kind of, uh, as you can, here's a good example here, uh, where he's, Dane's trying to get to the ball and there, he's got a bit of a problem getting through, uh, getting through to play the ball because there's somebody in his way. And, um, so, so that's the basics of interference. Um, I, I can't get to the ball for some reason. It might be my fault. It might be my opponent's fault. Um, the players whose turn it is to strike the ball, we call the striker. And they're uh, entitled to some freedoms. Um, and, um, and, and the opponent, so they're entitled to, uh, basically have a have a line to the ball. They need to be able to get get to the ball and play it. 
and the non-striker, the opponent, they're obliged to provide the striker with a number of freedoms. But um, basically, um, up front, I. I, I, as the striker, need to be making every effort to get to and play the ball. And once I've finished my shot, I need to be making every effort to get out of the way of my opponent, who's now become the, the new striker, uh, so that they can get they can get to the ball and play it. So we're always switching switching roles. I'm trying to get to the ball. I'm, my opponent's trying to get out of my way. Now my opponent's trying to get to the ball, and I'm trying to get out of their way. So we're always moving around to um, to to allow to allow the opponent to get to and play the ball, and to, to uh, keep the rally flowing as long as we can. And uh, we don't want to. Uh, that that's what we want to do. We want to keep the rally going. We all want to have a good workout. We all want to have fun. Um, so let's let's keep the rally going as long as we can until somebody makes a really good shot and their opponent can't get it. So that's uh, hopefully that's the end of the rally. It's when when I make a really good shot and it's not when I miss a really easy shot. I want to make a good shot, but either one of those can happen. I can, uh, it can be my turn. I got lots of room, got lots of time. I got my opponent cornered. I've got a full three quarters of the court I could hit to, and then I slam it into the tin, which is, oh, it hurts. I haven't done that since this morning. Um, anyway, so let's continue. So interference occurs when the opponent, the non-striker, does not provide the striker with one or more of the four freedoms stipulated in the rules. The striker has the option, um, and this is this is a key point here, they can either stop and ask for a let by saying let please. Um, if they don't say let please, um, it's not the end of the world. In an in an officiated match, very few of the pros actually say "let please." They they just look at you, and, and you're supposed to interpret that as "let please." But uh, um, in a, in a friendly, if 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 I stop and you're in my way, um, so so sorry. Let's play it the other way around. If my opponent stops. And I'm in their way. I look at them and I say, "Do you want to let?" That's the um, that's the let's get along friendly way to friendly way to do things. Either they either they've said yes, let up front, or I, as as the non-striker, offer them a let if I know that I was in their way to get to the ball. So um, you you should ask for a let immediately. If you actually go through any interference that you had, you get to the ball and you say, whoa, that's a good shot. I'd rather have asked for a let back there when I was going past my opponent. That's not gonna work. So if you go through and you find a, a really good shot that you don't wanna play, or you play the ball and um, it goes into the 10, you miss it all together, you can no longer ask for a let at that point because you played through the interference. Um, a player's excessive swing can also contribute to interference for the opponent when it becomes the latter's turn to play the ball. So um, the more experienced a player you are, the uh, shorter and sweeter your swing is going to be. And um, in general, um newer players can actually be uh fairly dangerous particularly on the back end so um i'll just maybe you can maybe you can see this hopefully so if i'm if i'm here hitting a backhand i hit the ball and i finish somewhere around here my opponent's over here now if i've 
if I'm a, a, a fairly new player, quite often a backhand looks like this. Almost knocked the book off my shelf. And uh, if you're standing, if your opponent is standing in this area, they're either ducking for cover or they, they're getting hit in the face. And if that's happened, it's be, it's not because they weren't where they were supposed to be. It's because your swing was excessive, and they should uh, they should be able to get a let in a situation like that. So, um, uh, in my uh, in my many years of refereeing, I've actually seen two people. Uh, getting nailed on excessive backswings and spitting teeth all over the uh all over the court it's not a it's not a pretty sight and um i'd highly recommend that uh, you, you not get too close to to your new opponents especially on the on the uh on the backhand although it can happen on the forehand but not as much it happens more when when you're somewhere where you're not supposed to be you actually move into their swing and there's uh there's nothing they can do but if they if they don't see it coming and and uh you may you may hit them in a situation like that you can um while we're on the subject there are uh not a lot but some people wear my mouth guards it's not a it's not a bad thing to do um it's a very good thing for everybody to wear eye guards so um in in juniors it's it's mandatory everywhere um lots of uh pretty good players uh wear eye guards and uh it's uh it, it, if if you if you get used to them and you start with them they're not going to bother you at all so um i highly recommend wearing eye guards I know when uh, when I when I started wearing eye guards, I actually watched the ball a lot better. I wasn't afraid to turn around and watch what my the shot that my opponent was was taking uh, and worrying about getting a ball in the eye. Um, nothing worse than getting a ball in the eye. You can uh, you can lose your sight. So wear eye guards. Everybody wear eye guards. Um, so where were we? So the striker must stop play and ask for a let. And um, excessive swing can also contribute. Um, so each time players stop because of interference, the uh, players themselves must come up with a consensus of either, yes, we're going to play a let on that, uh, no let, or a stroke. Now. Uh, if I'm asking for a let in a friendly, uh, not a not a good idea for for my opponent to say, "There's no way you were going to get to that ball." Uh, I'm not giving you a let. We're not going to be getting along too much too much uh, longer. We're not going to want to play each other if that happens all the time. Basically, um, I would say. Uh, for a friendly game, let's just get rid of that. So either it's going to be yes, let, or it's going to be a stroke. Now, um, the um, in in terms of getting to and playing the ball, if if uh, if I've if I've hit a really loose shot and um your and my opponent is coming at the coming at the ball asking for a let and they're easily going to get there and I'm not getting out of the way I'm just standing there admiring my shot perhaps um they ask for a let I should just take the ball and give it to them uh give them a stroke give them the point because um I wasn't doing my due diligence to get out of their way and give them a chance to play a shot. So um, as the as the striker, if you ask for a let, um, 
be satisfied with getting a let. Don't ask for a stroke, but your your opponent should know that if if they weren't getting out of their way or they stopped your swing or they blocked the front wall, then they should be getting a stroke. Um, another uh, another way that you can um, kind of adjudicate this if if you've got some spectators at the back, uh, they'll be happy to help you out. You know, you, they'll be they'll be signaling, yeah, you, you should get a let for that, or uh, you should get a stroke. You either mark it with a fist or a or a cut of the cut of the neck, um, and a, a shake of the head, and and one of these. No, you weren't going to get that. That should be a no let. But um, that's for maybe somebody watching your game to help you out with. Okay. So, oh, better clear my X. So you're going to give direct access to the ball and um, request for let. So this form of interference occur quite a bit uh, in in COVID times. There's a um, in, in in Squash Canada, anyway, there's a uh, uh, a no touch let policy. So if I'm rather than me crashing into you and and proving that I was going to get to that ball, I should stop before I get to you and uh, and ask for my let and and a let should should always be given. Um, the best place you'll find as you play, the best place to be standing is on the tee. And um, if we get another, I don't think I showed you where the tee was, but the tee is um, at the front service line and the middle quarter line where they join, there's a tee. And if we get another drawing up, I'll, I'll actually show you where the tee was. But uh, it's a good place to be standing. and uh, and getting your opponent to run around. But you don't have the right to go directly back to the tee. You need to get out of the out of the striker's way first and then get back to the tee. And we call this arcing. Okay, so now we're going to uh, see a, a little video clip here and some a bit of interference. So you notice how they're getting out of each other's way until just right there. But um, the uh, light blue shirt, he's trying to get to the ball and white shirt's trying to get out of his way, not having much luck. So um, we're going to, we're going to play that again. Now he doesn't like this. He thinks he should have got the point, but uh, uh, because he doesn't think that white shirt is clearing properly. But um, definitely, you know, the ball's a little ways away, and we're gonna we're gonna give a a, a let in this circumstance in a, in a friendly game. So, white shirts trying to trying to move out of the way here, trying to move out this way. Blue shirts trying to come in. The ball is up here, so maybe he could have actually gone forward a little bit to get to that ball. But um, anyway, a good example of interference. And um, in COVID times, you wouldn't have got this close. You would have just asked for a let uh, sooner, and we would have we would have played the point again. So when you when you actually play a point uh, let you go back to the serve from the same court that you served in before the score doesn't change and uh we just it's it's like a do in okay now we also need to have uh freedom to swing at the ball which means a reasonable a reasonable backswing this is the striker 
uh, a swing at the ball and a reasonable follow through. And reasonable means um, you shouldn't extend more than necessary for the return to be attempted. Generally, no strain arm position and should tend towards vertical rather than horizontal. So you should finish, you should finish your swing uh, in front of you, kind of with your racket up to the up to the front wall rather than across a horizontal movement. And here's an example. Okay, so orange shirt there. He was completely prevented from making a swing. He had he had half a back swing and he hit his opponent. And uh, even before the uh, rally was over, uh, he knew he got he knew he got the point. Everybody knew they put the racket down. It was the score was 10-5. The game was over. So they're on their way out for their break. And here it is in slow motion. So the ball didn't come out the way that uh, he thought it was going. He thought it was going to. It actually kind of bounced funny out here. Uh, but uh, Gauthier in the orange shirt, his swing was prevented. Okay, and another freedom that you need to have is uh, freedom to strike the ball anywhere to any part of the front wall. So this orange bit is, uh, you need to have, the ball needs to have a line directly to any part of the front wall. Um, it applies whether the ball has reached the striker from the front wall or whether it has first hit a side wall and back wall, it doesn't matter. Um, the ball can go. Um, I can I can hit the ball. I can hit the ball here, 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 off the back wall, and now the ball's coming out here. Uh, when the striker is ready to hit the ball, um, you need to have a full front wall to shoot at. Timing for requests is important and um so it's when the striker would have would have hit the ball not at the moment that was called and keep in mind that uh it's where the ball is not where where you are so um if uh if i'm standing here and hitting this ball which is here and my opponent is here they the ball still has a direct line to the front wall without hitting your opponent so this is uh this is me here a and they say and the opponent's b now you can see that I can't see the I can't see the front wall, right? If I hit the ball here to the front wall, I'm hitting it through my opponent. But the ball, which is here, it can see all of the front wall. So that's keep keep that in mind. It's from the ball. And um, when you're when you're in a friendly. Uh, Quite often, uh, player B doesn't know exactly where player A is when they're ready to hit the ball, and um, I'll I'll turn around and say, uh, "Did uh, uh, is that is that your point, or or could you hit the front wall?" And if they if they had a direct line to the front wall when they were ready to hit the ball, then I give them the point. So I give them a stroke.
Okay, so here's an example of that. Okay, so when light blue shirt here was ready to hit the ball, um, dark blue shirt was blocking it. He was blocking a front ball shot. And these guys are quick. Just because he stopped and, and um, just because he stopped, hit the ball to the sidewall and caught it, doesn't mean that he wasn't ready to hit it a lot earlier. And even in this case, even if maybe there wasn't a full wall to hit, he would have hit him with his swing. So if he swung right there, he would have nailed him. So that's a stroke to, and a stroke and a point to light blue shirt. Okay, so uh, talk about winning returns. Um, I'm standing here asking for a let, and the ball's in the back corner. Should be no let. Um, but in a friendly, you're going to give them a let. Even if they're asking for silly, silly, silly ones on a on a uh, on a winning shot. Okay, same thing here. Um, this, uh, this player here is actually moving in this way, but the ball is going way back here and the correct line to get to that shot is back here. So that should be a no let, but again, in a friendly, you're going to give them a let anyway. Okay. Here's an important, uh, uh, an important rule for, um, particularly for beginners, anytime you turn on a ball, which means the ball goes down one side and comes out the other, um, I would encourage you to just ask for a let and not try to play the ball. Very dangerous to try and play the ball. So if, um, if X hits the ball here, X hits the ball here, it goes front wall, side wall, back wall and then into the middle y is actually uh, following this ball around uh, doesn't have to follow the ball around but sometimes uh, sometimes they actually turn around and watch the ball other times they'll just they'll just stand and they'll often uh, rather than follow the ball all the way around they'll just turn and look um, They'll be looking this way to uh, to see the ball coming, so their peripheral is going to catch this also. They're going to see the ball coming off the back wall, but they're not going to know where X is, and very dangerous for them to actually play this ball. And odds of hitting X are pretty reasonable, particularly with uh, less skilled players. And you'll always get a a let in this case, if you ask for a let, uh, as long as you can play the ball, as long as it doesn't nick and kind of drop into the back corner back here and you're not there. But pretty much always you get a let in the case like this. And uh, if you do actually hit the ball and after turning hit your player, your opponent, uh, you lose the point. That's the rule. Okay, uh, on a, on a, uh, and, and the same thing on this one here. So this ball comes to the front wall, into the middle, off the back wall, and over towards the side. Y has actually, uh, the, the ball, he's turned because the ball went down one side and back the other. So turning, just ask for a let. Okay, I'm going to have to speed things up a little bit. Well, I'm not going to have to speed them up too much. I'm almost done. So here's 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 an example of turning here.
Okay, so watch how uh, light blue shirt, Nick Matthews, he, he was going to play at sidewall, but he couldn't. And then he goes to the back and he bounces into the floor. He could have played that ball. He probably would have played it. Um, probably would have played it somewhere over here, maybe even sidewall, front wall, but uh, too dangerous. He decided to just ask for a let. You should get a let. Okay, so um, just a, a few uh, final final points on a little bit of uh, a little bit of etiquette. Um, arrive on time. Call your opponent to schedule or reschedule with ample time. Wear safety glasses. Uh, this one here, we're probably not going to we're probably not going to do this. Uh, shake hands before and after. So, so now, um, rather than shaking hands, we tap rackets. Um, offer lets or strokes when you obstruct play. Call your own double bounces. So if it bounces twice, um, give the other person the point. Don't pretend that it, you got it on the first bounce. Um, and call your out. Call your own out shots, pins, carries. Um, Compromise with the let when in dispute. Be gracious in victory and defeat. Respect your opponent in the game, and encourage those who fail to adhere to these commandments. And the bad things, things that we don't do, uh, fail to clear without offering a stroke to your opponent. Call wet lets when you're out of range or unprepared. If they had a good shot, uh, don't ask for a let. Pretend you could have got to it. Just say nice shot. Um, don't orchestrate lets when I'm able to reach a shot. Uh, don't use an excessive swing. Um, don't leave the court without thanking your opponent. Uh, no shouting and yelling. Um, give up your court when the time is up. Uh, don't bang your rackets on the wall or the floor or your opponent or even yourself and don't make excuses for poor play. And that's all I got. So pretty close, did my best. Can I take any questions? Amazing, thank you, Dave. That was a wonderful presentation. And uh, so we've opened the chat box up to questions. And so uh, we have a question from Phil, Phil Oza, I apologize if I got that incorrect, uh, asking, when your serve hits the sideline after hitting front wall, is it in or out? It's out. And if okay. it hits, uh, let's actually, let's see if we can find the, um, let's find our picture again. As Dave is looking for his picture, uh, any other questions from anybody? Feel free to type them in the chat. For those newbies on today's webinar that are new players that uh, want to learn more about refereeing, you can certainly reach out to Dave as well as the Squash Canada Officiating Committee, or you can also uh, contact your local province or territory squash association, and they can connect you with the many experienced national and provincial referees, some of which are on today's call. Um, you know, Chris Yap in BC, Vienno in uh, Quebec, and, and uh, I saw some people from Alberta uh, as a few examples, Darren Manley in Ontario. So if you have questions, please don't hesitate to contact any of us as we will certainly help you progress through the officiating ranks. Go ahead, Dave, and show your example. Okay, so um, this uh, it has to hit the front wall above the surface line. It can't touch the surface line and below the outline at the top. It has to hit the front wall in this area. And then it, if it bounces to the sidewall, it has to be in this area. It has to be below 
this uh, this line up top, and it can't actually be the back line, the, the line at the back, it can't touch that either. So it actually has to front wall, good on the side wall, and then land in the service, in the service box, the opposite, uh, sorry, the opposite back quarter in here. Um, and another thing that I was gonna point out, the T, the T is right here. There's the T. So right, this is the T and um, standing here is a nice place to be standing and running your opponent say there and there and there and there and you just stand right here. Good, good thing to do. So the next question we have, Dave, uh, can you bounce the ball and hit the serve or must you throw it in the air to serve? You have to throw it in the air, and um, you can't uh, you can't throw it off the side wall either. It has to go in the air and and hit. Um, now, sometimes when you're beginning, um, you'll um, you, you, sometimes when you're learning and you're beginning, you will throw it off the side wall and hit it off the side wall. You'll never bounce it off the floor. It just, uh, it doesn't bounce enough to, to make it any good, but um, it's it's not a good serve. You need to throw it in the air, either with your hand or your racket and then hit it. Okay, another question, Dave, from Leslie. If you swing and the ball hits your opponent because they are obstructing the front wall, is it a stroke or a let? Okay, if you actually swing at the ball intending to hit it and you miss it um, and they're in front of you, then you missed it. If you swing and you miss it and then it hits the, uh, um, the person behind you, um, you can you can you can uh, either you'd either lose the point or you might get a let but after it, it's a it's a second attempt so um you you can't swing and miss and then expect to win the expect to win the point and and a lot of the a lot of the uh a lot of the rules kind of uh are common sense you, you wouldn't expect to uh, you wouldn't ha you wouldn't expect uh, your opponent to have to clear twice because you took a you took a swing at it and then um, um, and then expect to expect to get a stroke and win the point. So um, uh, yeah. So some clarification then, Dave, on that question. Leslie's just um, asked or clarified. Uh, so if you've hit the ball then, so if you're, if you're serving oh. and you've hit the ball forward, but then it hits your opponent, say, before it hits the actual wall. Thank you for clarifying, yeah. Leslie. Yeah, if it hits the front wall, if the ball was going to the front wall and you haven't turned, it's your point. And, of course, you'll apologize because um, you didn't need to hit your opponent. You could have saw as for a let and you should have got the strokes because they, your opponent was blocking the front wall now if you if the ball was going to go side wall front wall and you hit the and you hit your opponent as long as the ball was going to go up it was going to be good uh, before it hit the uh the opponent or even if it's questionable whether it might have been good then you play a let. So if it's going to the side wall, if I'm hitting to the side wall and it hits my opponent and it was going to be a good shot to the front wall, yes, you get a let for that. If it was going to go directly to the front wall, it's your point, it's a stroke. It's your point. Great. So next question comes from Rayhan asking, if opponent is on the tee, can you ask for a stroke for front wall interference? You ask for a let, they should offer you a stroke. 
I mean, if I'm a referee and I and I see that, uh, it's going to be a stroke. But but we want to play again tomorrow. Um, you don't have, it, proper etiquette isn't to ask for a stroke. You ask for a let, and your opponent should offer you a stroke. Okay, any other questions from anybody in the room? Um, I'm just looking back. Uh, if the striker plays a dangerous shot and either the ball or the racket makes contact with the opponent, what would be the call? Um, so you would, um, it's, I, I would ask my opponent, please don't play those, I'll give you the point. So uh, that's that's the that's the right way to handle it. If it's a um, if it's a a properly officiated match and there's dangerous play, then the referee will actually stop play and uh, either warn the striker for playing dangerously or award strokes to the striker or it's to the non-striker because your opponent's playing uh, dangerously. Okay, another question from uh, from Kyle. What about a boast from the back of the court? Yeah, boast is it's, it, a boast is always going to be best. You're going to best you're going to get is a let. So um, if if I'm hitting a boast and it hits my opponent, then um, if it would have if if you think it would have made it to the front wall, if you both think it would have made it to the front wall without hitting or without the hit had the opponent not been there then it's a let if it uh if it wasn't ever going to make it to the front wall then uh you lose the point as the striker you lose the point okay and then kyle also asks if it hits the opponent and was going to hit either side wall or the front wall yeah, that's what I that's what I just answered. Okay. Uh and then Rayhan, I think this is clarification to his previous question. Uh he means standing on the T uh is by default stroke for other player. Uh pretty much because if you're standing on the T, almost any shot is going to be blocking the front wall. Unless unless you've turned. If you've turned then um if you've if you've turned then it's going to be a let but uh pretty much any shot non-turning shot if you're standing on the tee uh, it's going to be a stroke as long as you're as long as the ball's behind you obviously <laughs> if i'm standing on the tee if my opponent's standing on the tee and i'm sitting i'm standing uh two feet in front of them then they're obviously not blocking the front wall but normally uh yeah if the ball's behind you behind the my if if i'm behind my opponent and i'm striking and they're on the tee it's probably going to be a stroke perfect thanks dave stroke for the so strike I the, so i think in the interest of time if anyone has any additional questions uh what we will be doing is uh we've recorded this session and uh uh early next week I will be sending out the recording as well as the PowerPoint slides from uh, today's presentation to everybody. And uh, what we typically do is if you have questions, you can email myself and or Dave, uh, who is our presenter, and uh, you know we will certainly get you a uh, response very quickly. So if you do have questions that you think of after today's session, please don't hesitate to reach out and uh, we will get you an answer. Going forward, first and foremost, Dave, thank you for a wonderful presentation. That was uh, very informative and uh, educational. And uh, I think everybody took a little bit of something away, even if we aren't playing squash at the moment. Uh, for those of you still on the call, just a friendly reminder, we will have additional officiating webinars in the future. Dave mentioned at the start of the presentation, we've got one where we're kind of framing as determine the match call, and uh, that'll be something we're working on in the coming weeks to deliver probably uh, in uh, spring or summer, as well as there's some free webinars coming up for coaching and athlete development that are on our website related to school squash, squash 57, 
national physical and technical testing programs and next gen and junior national team pathways. So if any of those topics interest you, please don't hesitate to register via Club Locker. All of those are free as we continue to roll out uh, various uh, Squash Canada webinars for coaching, officiating and athlete development. Uh, and again, we thank you for attending tonight. Uh, thank you again, Dave, and uh, we hope everyone has a wonderful week. Thanks, everybody. Lots, lots of good questions. Bye, everybody. Bye.